Our panelists include four dynamic leaders who will share recent policy changes in their states. Our first panelist is Sharice Childers, the Director of Arkansas Career Education, Stephen Pruitt, the Commissioner of Education in Kentucky, Heather Justice, Executive Director of the Office of CTE right here in Tennessee, and Stephen Partridge, Vice President of Workforce Development, Northern Virginia, Virginia Community College. Please help me welcome all of our panelists to the stage. everyone. I'm Tamar Jacoby. Uh, thanks so much for being here and thanks to ACTE for the opportunity. Um, so, you know, for me and I think for, I can speak for my panelists, it's really an honor to be here among you. Uh, certainly I and many of, the, of my fellow panelists, you know, we sit in offices and we lobby legislatures and we take orders from legislatures and we think about this from far away. And we know that what you do is actually the important work. So um, it's really a pleasure for me and an honor for me and I think I'm speaking for my panelists. It's kind of humbling to be here among all of you. You know, I think about it all day long, but you do it. Um, so, so really a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't think there's a person among you who doesn't have a first-hand experience of the problem that we're here to talk about solutions for. You face this every day, every week, every, every month, certainly every year. What's the problem? Well, you all are educators. You know how to teach. You know how to communicate complicated material to students and help them understand it. And you do that because you love it and you're good at it. But I'm kind of guessing most of you didn't go into your profession because you wanted to build relationships with employers. I'm kind of guessing some of you are good at it. <laughs> I'm guessing, but, I, but you know, good at it naturally, kind of. But I'm guessing you didn't train for it. I'm guessing, you know, many of you don't much like it. And I'm guessing many of you have a hard time finding time for it in your day. And I think, but, you know, but, 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 we all agree that there can be no effective CTE without employer involvement. So whose job is it to make that engagement work and make it, to make it happen and make it work and make it work well? And I'm not gonna let you off the hook, right? It's partly your job. And I'm not gonna let those employers that I work with in Washington off the hook, it's partly their job. But the good news is that states part of what they can do is help. Because they can set up the frameworks that make it easier for you to do it and make it easier for the employers. They can give you the tools, they can give you the templates, they can create the right incentives for you and the employers to get together and make that difficult, you know, have that communication. I, I like to say employers are from Mars and educators are from Venus. The states can give you some of the tools to help you bridge that gap. And so what we're going to do today, why we brought these people together, this distinguished panel, they are mostly high-level CTE state officials and one knowledgeable educator um, from four of the states that do the best job of creating that framework, providing those tools, templates, and incentives. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What are the best tools and templates and incentives that policymakers can provide to help create, and we never want to lose sight of the aim, right, to help create a situation where you have a better chance of succeeding in engaging those employers and collaborating with them to provide better education for your students. So with that, we are going to start, we're going to start by having a kind of conversation where we ask each of them to talk a little bit about what their state does really well. And so they're going to do a little bit of show and tell about their states, and then we're going to get to kind of a broader general discussion. So, Sharice, let's start with you. You're sitting right next to me. Um, you come from Arkansas, and it's my understanding that one of the things 
one of the ways, exciting ways you're engaging employers is around developing curriculum. And we know that's kind of the nub of it, developing curriculum, or one of the nubs of it. Tell us more about it. Well, I'll give you an example of what we're doing with, uh, with one, in, one school in particular in Arkansas. Uh, they recognize, their employers in the area recognize that there was a skills gap in the advanced manufacturing area. So they went to the employer, went to uh, their local chamber of commerce and engaged numerous chamber of commerces in that area and looked at curriculum, looked at what they needed the students to know as they were seeking employment in those particular industries in the area of advanced manufacturing. So they looked at all of the key components that would be needed in a curriculum that would be focused on advanced manufacturing. Uh, then they worked, they brought in educators to help them assist that with the uh, curriculum and the frameworks. They uh, brought in the state leadership so that they could get input and buy-in from what they're doing and also we're looking at how this could be replicated in other areas of the state for other employers in our advanced manufacturing area. But I will say the most important thing that they did was that they started a year before they offered the course bringing this to the attention of the students and the teachers and the parents and educating them and informing them of the importance of advanced manufacturing in that central Arkansas area. And then before, uh, before they offered the course, all of the students were informed. So they anticipated that they would have 50 students in that initial class and it was double what they expected. Wow, wow. So the employer engagement is key but then also following up with information and knowledge so that students know why it's important and parents will support that decision. So you've got actually two roles for employers you already laid out for us. One is developing that curriculum, but the other is making the public case for why CTE matters. You know, if you can get the employers telling it, the people, we're creating jobs, you guys need to know this. But let's, so let's go a little deeper on the curriculum development, because I've been in rooms where employers have tried to describe the skills they need. Did they, how do, you know, did they have somebody facilitate? First of all, the first question is, did they, was it their initiative? Was it the employer's initiative? Yes. Wow, so educators didn't go to them, they came to, to they yes. got together. And then did they, how did they, how did they, you know, do that curriculum work. That sounds well, tricky. Well, they, they had a framework, so they had something to start with. Mm -hmm. And then they pulled from different pieces of material and also looked at what their certifications are and what's laid out in, their, in the requirements of those certifications and then put it all together. So it, it resembles something that was already out there and had been created, but it's specific to their needs so that these students are prepared for the jobs in their area, but then could also you know, add to those as the program expands in other parts of the state where it's specific to those industry needs. And how's it working? It's working great. Oh, that's great. They're expanding and, and uh, we have the, uh, the administrator that was at that school that was very instrumental in getting all of this together. Um, she was recruited by another school in another part of the state, so she's done that there at that school as well with employer engagement and partners who brought in equipment and, and are guiding the curriculum and the training of the teachers. School leader, it always comes back to school leader. Um, Heather, let's go to you. <laughs> so we, this is, we're talking here a little bit about inputs on the front end. One of the interesting things you're doing in your state is outcomes, industry credentials. I know it always sounds scary when we start to talk about credentials, but um, at least when I try to talk about it, you know, the guy sitting next to me on airplanes. But um, talk to us about what the state's doing around industry recognized certifications and, and how that's working. Yeah, sure. So one of the things uh, that we're looking at in Tennessee, and, and this, this is mimicked at the district uh, school level especially, but they're industry advisory councils. At the state, we actually have them for each career cluster and utilize them to really be the voice of industry up at that state level to get a good look at what the landscape looks like across the state. So first was um, turning to our industry advisory councils, making sure that they actually represented the same type of landscape that it looks like in that area, right? So you would want small rural businesses represented, you would want urban businesses represented, um, the larger companies, et cetera. And turning to them to ask, what credentials do you value and recognize? And I'd say in our state, that and is really important. Um, the difference between recognize and value can mean that they know of something, 
versus they use it in a hiring decision and an employing decision, right? And for us, that was really discerning. And so that one question of our industry advisory councils helped us scale down industry certifications that we promoted from around 200 to now around 53. Wow. That's and cool. so the power there is, if, if we're asking educators to focus their time and attention for students attaining these certifications, are we making sure that those are the most important things that students need to be mastering in their classroom? And has industry weighed in and told us that that is actually the case? And so we've worked really hard to make sure the industry is saying these things have value and then that that is then where we can ask districts to place their focus for the classroom. Yeah, that sounds like a great process. And what's interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in each case, like how do we get the employers to the table? And it's interesting, in your case, the employers already volunteered to come to the table. In your case, you've kind of already rounded them up and put them on a committee. We'll, we'll talk more about this in a minute. But talk to us, another interesting thing I know that you're doing in Tennessee is you've, you've got some clever way to hire. I mean, one of the things I'm sure every school in the audience is facing is how do we hire those teachers out of industry? Uh, tell us how you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, recruitment and retention is difficult in current technical education. I don't think Tennessee is alone in that. Um, what we're, we're trying to do is we've already done as a state some of the lower hanging fruit. So alternative license programs, providing for those opportunities. So what does that mean, alternative license programs? So providing for opportunities for individuals to come directly from industry into the classroom. Without going through the normal teacher certification. Correct. They'd be teaching and then actually getting that certification as they're teaching, right? They get their license on the front end, but then actually continue that license after they're teaching, while they're teaching. Um, that's kind of a lower hanging fruit from a policy decision. You can do that um, and implement that, but then that still doesn't satisfy the gap, right? So how are we effectively recruiting from industry and getting them in? And I think the hard part is with alternative licensing, you're still asking an industry person to leave their job and come teach full time, often at a pay cut. Uh, so especially in our areas that we need most. So in Tennessee, obviously not a lot different from other states, but health science, uh, IT, and advanced manufacturing, significant pay cuts sometimes to walk into education. So we actually recently got a grant with the US Department of Education to focus specifically on the CTE teacher pipeline. And we're trying to think outside the box um, at making um, a Tennessee version of a European model, if you will, on co-teaching. How can you entice industry into the classroom without them having to leave their post? Yeah. How can you build on those relationships and then drive some of that at the rural level where they know they don't have as much access to industry professionals to leave and then come in and teach full time. So that's fascinating. So there's a full time teacher and somebody's still working at the plant, but they come on Tuesday and they co teach. And how much time, you know, to make that effective and worthwhile, how much time <laughs> in the week do you have to get them into the classroom? So that's going to be the big question. Um, we're actually getting ready uh, to, to move into what that will look like in the next year at pulling in districts, seeing what that pilot looks like, talking to industry partners. And I don't think. I think this is important as we talk about policy and the implication at the district level in a different states. There's not a one size fits all model. And so making sure that we're being flexible enough to hold the line on quality and rigor, but also at the same time being flexible enough in figuring out what that looks like in an urban district, what that looks like in a suburban district, what that looks like in a rural district, and especially given the different types of industry partners at the table. So are you guys ready for this? They're going to hire industry, I'm kidding, but are you, they're going to hire industry professionals and bring them into the classroom with you. Um, don't have to answer. Um, now we're getting to the Stephen part of the program. We have two Stevens, and somebody was calling them the Stephen PH and the Stephen V. I'm not sure I can even keep them that um, separated, but I do know one is from Kentucky and one is from Virginia. So Stephen from, so Kentucky Stephen. Um, you're, you're I'm doing. The PH. Uh, you're the PH. Okay. Well, is that, that sounds, Maybe that I'm sounds a chemical. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so um, I know uh, in Kentucky, one state away, you guys are doing some really interesting stuff around apprenticeship. Tell us about it. Yeah, we um, in Kentucky we have a, a program that we're pretty proud of. Um, in fact, this past June, USED ranked it as one of the best or the best in the country. Um, it's our technical. Uh, it's called our track program, uh, and in that program, we are able to uh, provide for certified apprenticeships uh, that actually are approved by our, our Department of Labor. Uh, it's a th four course sequence that each of our uh, partners offer to our kids, but one of the, one of those courses has to be a co-op. So it, it provides our kids the opportunity to go straight into the workforce, straight into the to a certified program. Uh, we we have it in manufacturing, automotive. Uh, early childhood um, and skill training, and so it's. And we're pretty happy because we're about to add healthcare and IT. In fact, 
we launched this week a, a new partnership with Interapt, and we've already had four districts reach out saying they want to be a part of it. Um, and we've also done some, I think, creative things around it in that, um, no surprise, some of our business partners are leery of hiring yeah. our students. Um, you know, and I, I, I see that. They worry about child labor and they worry about the risk. So we have a, <clears throat> a, a program that we partnered with ADECO. I know. Uh, and we're, I think we're the first uh, state that's done this where ADECO actually basically assumes the risk. And the business partner actually just pays the, the difference, which is about 35% of what that cost is. And that way the student is actually the employee of ADECO, but they're not, uh, but the, the industry itself is not having to accept that, that risk. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, what it allows for are our students to go into these workplaces with a, the, the industry having a greater level of comfort, but the kid is actually going to walk away with a job. Um, and we think enough of it that we've added as part of our accountability system that this is one way a student can show uh, that they are career ready. So we're going to get to your accountability system in a second, but two quick questions about this. So can you, I, to, I promised I wouldn't ask them any numbers, but can you give us any sense of scope or scale of how many kids are doing that? And, and the second question is, is it, you know, how, what, what do you really have to do to, I mean, to convince those, do you go out door to door to convince the employers to take students? How does that work? Well, it's really an untapped resource. Um, we had this year probably around 56,000 kids that, wow. were, uh, that were available but we only had a little over 3,000 actually take advantage right, of it. Right, right. Now, I think there's a combination of things there. I think part of it is, is the availability, but part of it, too, is I'm not real sure in our old accountability system that it promoted it. Because one, one of the things you want to do is actually get the schools to help you promote it right. and to recruit. So it's one of the reasons why we made a big deal about it in accountability, but uh, it's really been an untapped resource. Mary Taylor, um, who's here, for any of you that want to go talk to her, um, <clears throat> really leads that program for us, and we sort of kid her all the time that we're going to pretty much put her in the car and she's going to go door to door. But um, it's it's uh, it, we are going to try to to take a new tact and CTE in general, but with this program, really trying to flood the field about all the availability that's there for our kids. So talk a little bit about your accountability system. I mean, you know, the point about accountability: what's get measured gets improved. So uh, talk about how you're putting CTE in the accountability. Well, um, I guess the way to start is, is I, I, Kentucky's had career readiness as part of our accountability system for a while, um, but there's also this sort of underlying philosophy. Um, you know, I, I am a pretty strong believer that while, yes, education is the way out of poverty, the real way out of poverty is a job, uh, a career. You know, you, if you really want to get out of poverty, you make money. Um, and so... That's kind of an underlying principle for a lot of the things that we're doing with accountability and our future graduation requirement. And so for a student to be uh, career ready, we have really put an emphasis on students being able to show that proficiency through industry certification. In fact, we give a little bit of a bonus for uh, kids that graduate with an industry certification in high demand areas. So we have uh, actually already done the, the research we are able to tell in the 10 areas of our state what the high need careers are, and schools will get that extra bonus point if they f have students graduate in their area being able to fill jobs. Does that, that mean area. money? Bonus points mean money or just points? Uh, it's points. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's points. But, you know, considering how much people love banners, yeah, yeah. I've never seen anybody love banners like educators. They want to <laughs> hang those dang banners <laughs> up in, in front of the school, and so they'll do anything for extra points. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we want to give them their banner. So they do their, um, they get those extra points. We work with our workforce in investment boards to actually identify what the industry certifications are. And um, they get those extra bonus points for, for that aspect of it. Yeah. But we talk about transition ready quite a bit in our, in our accountability system. Uh, but we also have a thing called opportunity and access. Uh, which is a, a little bit different in Kentucky uh, than I think in a lot of other places, where we also include career re uh, a career readiness aspect in opportunity. So what are you actually offering these pathways? Are you partnering with other districts to offer those pathways? Do you have career counselors starting in middle school to actually help um, guide kids as they go through this whole process? So there's the actual part of the student being able to achieve that, but we also have it about the school climate, if you will, about are you really making a commitment to this? Great. 
great, great. School leaders, counselors, keep coming back to the people, right? Um, so, <laughs> um, so Stephen with a V, uh, <laughs> Virginia Stephen. Oh, it's got suddenly got easier. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Um, Virginia has a program I love. It used to have a clunky name. Now it has a slick, cool marketing name. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah, um, we launched about a year and a half ago a statewide program called Fast Forward. And it, it, it was basically a credential payment program where the state invests in non-credit credential training by paying two-thirds of the cost. So for a course that used to cost $900 in our open enrollment catalog, it now costs $300. So the student comes in, pays $300. When they complete the course, the college is reimbursed the second third. And when they get the credential, we get the last third. So this is pay per performance. Now the students on the hook for the second third, if they don't complete the course, they go to first few classes and say, this isn't for me, and they walk out the door, they have to pay that second third. So in the first year, we've had like 98% class completion. So that's not where we're losing people, it's the credential attainment piece. And in the first year, um, I'd say for Northern Virginia, we were at about half the people getting the credential, half not. Oh, and wow. Part of it was we didn't make it mandatory to sit for the exam, so people who have the best intentions, they sort of come in and say, yeah, I'm gonna take it, and then life gets in the way, and you have to drive across town. If you're from Northern Virginia, driving across town could be two hours to a testing center. Uh, so we started to build that into the actual class. So now we're probably approaching 70 to 75% attainment rate now that that's mandatory to sit for it, to not have to pay that second, third back. So it's really helped get the credentials up. I think the big challenge is what are the credentials we offer? You know, we did a lot of data research and looking at what employers publish their, we use burning glass, and so we looked at all the jobs and what jobs, you know, can get a standard of living in Northern Virginia. So cyber healthcare are our biggest two that we offer. And they're not easy tests, and they're not cheap tests. And the test is part of the, the credential exam, so it's, you're, it's baked into your cost. Uh, we're seeing employers start to take notice of this, where they're actually asking us, hey, this is something we looked at before because we in higher ed did a bad thing maybe 20 years ago. We jumped on the bandwagon for credentials and we over-credentialed people in things that didn't mean anything to anyone. So there's, I think nationwide, there's about 15,000 different credentials. Only about 100 to 150 show up in nationwide data as employer demand, meaning they advertise them online as part of the job description. So there's, a, there's mixed market signals sometimes to the job seeker about what really is a high demand credential when colleges are pushing things that maybe really aren't in demand. So this really focuses us on what is gonna get you the credential, but the next phase of this program is they're gonna start looking at job employment data for these students. So just a couple, dig a little deeper on the program. It's for non-credit courses, right? These are Correct. mostly short non-credit courses. So these are people who couldn't, didn't have any Pell money, didn't have any way to pay for this in the past, and suddenly they have a way to pay for it. They do. That they, that, that's performance-based. Yep. And um, it's I, I want to know a little more about how the employers are taking notice, but before we get to that, it's my understanding is it's kind of changed the kind of student that's coming for these courses now, right? That's yeah, in I the non-credit world, it was most incumbent workers that were looking to upskill. So, and in some that could afford discretionary income of paying, you know, a thousand dollars plus for a class. Now they're actually there is actually financial aid for that first third, where a student can pay ninety percent, and so it's only ten percent. It, it's for the whole program. So you get a thousand dollar course that costs you basically, you know, ten percent of that. So it's it's changed the dynamic a lot. Where some of the students are coming in, not necessarily who our student was before in the non-credit world, which was they have experience in higher ed. They often have a associate degree, bachelor's degree, or higher. Uh, and so they didn't need as much support services. Now the students are coming in, they're UC uh, maybe first generation. They, have, they do not have a bachelor's degree. And so they're coming in thinking that credential is gonna get them the job. And we have to do a better job because sometimes in Northern Virginia, it's a little hyper education focused up there. Yeah. Um, if you look at the cyber jobs, 90% of them require a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, so it's not the entry-level workforce that we think of when you look at the nationwide demographics. So it's, it's sometimes a credential or two, uh, especially in cyber. It might be Network Plus, Security Plus, it might be Certified Ethical Hacker, and it's not one that gets you the job, it's maybe a combination. So we, the nice thing about the program is there's no um, lifetime cap. So if you're a student going through, you can get you can do it again. A plus, wow. you can complete it and go to the next one and next one. Yeah. The only requirement is domicile in Virginia. Wow. And so talk about how the employers are starting to notice. I haven't looked into that. Uh, they're excited. They're, you know, I'll, since we're in Tennessee, I'll give the example. Is, uh, recently, one of our biggest cyber employers who's struggling to fill jobs decided to create their next thousand jobs about 30 minutes outside Nashville. 
And so we're taking notice of that from an economic development standpoint. It's like, this is not a good thing. The jobs are leaving our marketplace to go elsewhere because it's, it's not only a high cost of living, they just can't find the people. Yeah. We're at 1% unemployment in IT in Northern Virginia. Wow. The, it is the highest concentration of cyber jobs in the world. Wow. Partly because of its location to, to military and government. But because of that, we really struggle. And part of it's the career awareness is there aren't enough students going into that field locally. Uh, so the businesses are left with little alternative other than import folks to the market. So looking at how we can give them alternatives than a computer science degree, which I mean, we produce a lot of them, doubled the number in the past 10 years, but that's still not keeping up with demand. Yeah. So how we go in, we work with employers to talk about, okay, listen guys, do you really need a bachelor's? And we sit down and you kind of map out and say, you know, someone with an associate degree in cyber with these three credentials could do exactly what that position requires, but you just throw on the bastards as, a, as an add-on. And are you persuading them? Is that, is that getting they're, through? They're getting, yeah, they're desperate. I mean, that's yeah. always a good time to go in and, and make tells. a case, that, and yeah. they're desperate. It didn't work, you know, eight years ago during the recession, right. but now it's really, yeah. they're starting to take notes and say, okay, give it a try. Um, an apprenticeship, too, is something that they're starting to wake up to as an alternative methodology. Okay. So we want to talk about funding, but we're going to wait for that because we did a lot of this. So let's, let's open it up and let's all have a conversation with each other. Um, so let's go back to my, it's a little, little overcute, but my employers are from Mars, educators are from Venus. You know, I'll speak from the point of view. I work with a lot of employers. That's kind of how I approach this field. I run a coalition in D.C. of employers. I spend a lot of time with employers. Employers are you know, downright skeptical of educators, right? They, you all know, I don't have to tell you, they talk, a di we, we employers talk a different language, we move at a different pace, you know, uh, and, and you guys don't speak employer usually. <laughs> um, so talk to me about how you bridge that gap. Because that, you know, the employers, the other thing about employers is they might be trying to bridge that gap, but maybe not as intentionally as you're trying. You know, they're sort of coming in, I'm the customer. <laughs> um, so talk to me about how, whoever wants, jump in. Uh, sure. you, go, go for it. Where we have seen the greatest success is when a teacher um, reaches out to an employer or an employer reaches out to a teacher where they may have already had a, a mutual uh, relationship or, or interest. And then um, where we're seeing the greatest success is when those employers are invited to come in and engage in the conversation and that the teacher, the administrators are open to change. So that's where we're seeing. And, and then the, the possibilities are limitless. Once they get together and they find someone that is interested in making sure that they're teaching what's ne what is needed, they begin to as you were talking earlier and the others on the panel were talking about um, coming in and teaching, co-teaching, uh, bringing in their expertise, uh, showing the students the, the actual workplace, either virtually or on site. Uh, we're using a product where in, uh, employers can do an online uh, virtual training uh, with the students that are in the classroom. Wow. So once you develop that relationship, they're really, educators are, are, if they haven't been employed in industry before, they are a little anxious to make that first step. But if you have both of them and provide them with opportunities, like in Arkansas, we have the regional advisory councils where we put our educators and employers together um, so that they can start engaging in that conversation, then again, the possibilities are limitless. We see the employers uh, providing supplies, equipment, time, um, and energy into that program and assisting the teacher where our greatest fear is that the teacher becomes so engaged in the employer's role <laughs> they the that they leave the classroom and then go to the employer and we just had that happen lose, recently. Lose the staff, lose professionals. That's oh right. my goodness. But so you said you have, you, in a way there are three interesting things in what you just said. I mean you said, first you said it can be both on a council but it's also really important to have one, those one-to-one -one relationships. You know a lot of people when I talk about in policy circles it's going to happen one-to-one, -one, they say oh come on that'll never happen, you know that's too 
much, we can't do that. But I think the one-to-one -one are important. The other imp two important things you said, teachers open to change. Uh, <laughs> hope you all, use, all you educators heard that. It's important for the educators to be open to change, and administrators. But the, and then you had this idea, once, if the state is the matchmaker and sets up that first date, the romance can often develop on its own. I mean, I think those are three really important principles. Um, who else wants to um, jump in? I guess I would say, you know, I, for me, there's a few things. First of all, just realizing there is a difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, we have conversations with employers all the time, and, you know, they'll say, we just want soft skills. You know, just give us a kid that can show up on time, that's not on drugs, and we're good. And you're like, really? <laughs> that's really all you want? You don't care if they can, you know, read? <laughs> Do a little arithmetic. I mean, you know, come on. And but at the same time, then you have the educators who can carry on in a full conversation without saying any words because we talk in <laughs> letters all the time. So having an interpreter sometimes yeah. and just helping them see that. So you actually have professional interpreters. I mean, uh, basically, yeah. I mean, the areas you put in those rooms. You sort of have to do that. I mean, I, I think that, that you know, probably one of the biggest jobs that Laura Arnold, our CTE director, who's also here, said is is she has to constantly help people see how to speak to one another, but yeah. just recognizing that there's a, a difference. Then being able to have the schools um, be able to let go of some of the control yeah, a little bit. And, and I think that's, you yeah. know, it, it's being willing to be open to change, but it's also being willing to realize that what you have been doing may not actually be meeting the needs. We, I mentioned earlier, we used our workforce data and, and identified the high demand sectors around each uh, in each district in our state. Um, and then we did a, a heat map that showed what you're actually offering in your schools. Mm. Well, you know, they weren't real thrilled to see, you know, their picture up on the mm. PowerPoint that you're not offering any mm. of these. Mm. So there's an awareness aspect of it and there's a way, and, and then you've got to help them know how to go and make the request of industry. Because I think that when you go ask industry, sometimes educators just go say, we need your help. And industry says, great, we want to help you. Mm. And education says, well, give us money. Yeah. No, it, it, you know, there's yeah. got to be a different kind of conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, you know, it's reminding me of, of early days of dating. You know, you have to change. You have to be open to, uh, <laughs> you have to be open to getting into that relationship. You have to be willing to realize maybe the way you do it doesn't work uh, for the, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. dating's an interesting <laughs> analogy because I think sometimes there's a lot of first dates and, yeah. There's no kiss at the end of that first yeah, day. Yeah. Just... <laughs> oh, oh, I wasn't going there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just, just, uh, okay, we'll not have a second date. We'll go. Let's go. Let's go down the line since we're going this way. I think. I think to echo uh, two things that really stand out um, when you're talking about industry engagement, especially down at the local level, is is one the ability to actually have meaningful engagement. So it's more than yeah. just like checking the box to say we have an industry yeah. advisory council and then it becomes a dog and pony show. So the great part is, yes, they love to see all the good things that you're doing and they love to see all the things you're gonna show them about your programs, but they wanna say and there needs to be some end result in that or else you'll start to see them disconnecting. Um, the other key piece I think we've heard from our, our schools and districts who do this really well is to meet them where they're at Sometimes having a meeting at the end of the day is not convenient for business or getting away first thing in the morning isn't the most convenient. And so thinking about the best time that's good for them or even if they don't need to come to the school, if you need to go to them. And I think thinking outside the box on where to meet them rather than making them be, um, well, lunch for us is always good. So you just come to us and we'll, we'll you know, offer you lunch. And I think that's not the incentive that it once was. Um, the other piece is understanding that to the point of the ask, if it's always an ask for money, mm -hmm. then they're going to feel like they're not getting a return on investment or, or if they are giving you money, what is that return on investment? And I think return on investment can include time. Um, and so I think uh, we mentioned this earlier in having multiple opportunities for industry to engage. Yeah. So that could be where they're coming to the school to do a career yeah. fair. It could be where they're hosting parents for a job site and finding out where they're comfortable dipping the toe in the water that ask sometimes of a new industry partner can scare them away and then they'll never come back if you're asking them to place students immediately when they don't even really understand how your programs work. Um, understanding if they get in on the front end that, oh, our students actually complete content related to this career and so they're actually going to be a safer employee for you to hire. That kind of helps alleviate some of those child labor laws, uh, makes them a little less gun shy. But then also being honest and having a conversation with labor, to the commissioner's point, you might not see if you're participating in a robust work-based learning experience, 
and you're, you're targeting juniors, that student's not gonna enter your workforce that summer. Um, so thinking about how long that supply chain management line actually has to be for them to see the fruition of their labor, <laughs> literally and metaphorically, um, I think is important and it's having that honest conversation that if they are engaging in this, they might not see the fruits of their labor for four years. Yeah, so interesting, I mean, the, that, you know, that meaningful versus check the box is so important. I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, as I travel around and see these these relationships, it's so often check the box. And you know, I'll never forget the I'll never forget the community college I visited. I won't say what state where they I said I want to meet your your engaged employers, and they said, well, these are our three most engaged employers. They've been on our advisory boards for ten years. And I went out to these employers, and they couldn't stop talking about really good ideas about what should happen in the school. And I said, well, do you tell the school that? And they said, well, the school never asks those questions. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, meaningful is hard. Meaningful is hard. And when you don't, when you haven't seen meaningful, meaningful is and, hard. And over-engaging the same partners. And, and so I yeah. do think that if you get a good partner, mm -hmm. constantly going back to the same well is a problem. And so there is a level of domino effect that if you engage some of the right employers in the front end, they then encourage their colleagues and to participate, but not always going back to that one person. Yeah. And Steve, one thing you Steve. said, too, that I thought was really important was the issue of the outcomes. Because th employers want to know outcomes. They want to know how many people can you give me. And educators tend to talk about process. Yeah. And, and I think that, I mean, and that's important because we're not, we're not developing widgets. I mean, there are kids and there are individuals and we're dealing with people, but, but finding a way to bridge that gap of, of, yeah, talk enough about process just to get them to understand it might be four years, right. but don't just sit there and talk about every education word that you've ever learned. <laughs> I mean, education being goes great in a faculty meeting, it's not great in a business meeting. Steve, you will probably want to come Yeah, I, I like the term translator. Um, I often <laughs> sit in meetings with businesses and I will bring some of our subject matter experts from our faculty in, and the biggest thing that scares off employers is the speed at which we operate. Um, you know, when it, when the non speed, the non speed, I mean, it, it business oper yes. operates quarter to quarter. I mean, they're saying, I need this now in two quarters from now, it may change based on how they're performing in the marketplace. And as an educator, a lot of times we just kind of go through the motion of saying, well, to start a new program will take two years. And then I'll take another two years, you know, for the perfect student to make their way through it. So we'll have a solution to you in four plus years is not really what an employer wants to hear. When they show up on your doorstep proactively, it's usually because they have a burning issue that needs solving yesterday. They care about the supply chain. They're thinking where my workers gonna come from over the next 20 years, the people we hire are gonna have the soft skills, they're gonna have the, the, the ability to write and critically think, but they usually have, I'm an HR person, I, we're, we're going in a different direction, I need 100 new people, help me. So they're looking to the graduates you have now. So non-credit often sits in there because I'm gonna be taking our existing population of students or else individuals in the marketplace already with a lot of the baseline skills and upskilling them. And so, you know, we, we recently did a project with Amazon where they wanted to start an apprenticeship. Um, AWS is, is kind of based in, in our Herndon marketplace and they wanted an apprenticeship started and they came to us and they said they'd like to launch their first class in eight weeks. <laughs> right. And they had no curriculum. <laughs> And so our, our faculty people just say, well, that's impossible, you know, all the usual reasons, and we got it done wow. because we wanted to prove to them that it was that we possible. Could do it. Yeah. And so we're using that as a test case to say, listen, guys, it is possible to move quickly, and businesses don't often care about credit. Yeah, credit, no, they don't. They don't. Care. I mean, yeah, from yeah. a tuition assistance, they'll say, yeah, yeah our, we have to get a yeah. degree if you're pursuing that. But yeah. from a business modeling standpoint, they want the knowledge and the yeah. skills. Yeah. They don't care how it's acquired. Yeah. So we need to think through the credit model sometimes. Yeah, and I think yeah. you make an important point about there is a level that we can play in our partnerships with the post-secondary institutions. So if K-12 is effectively doing our job and preparing kids to transition into that post-secondary landscape, right, mm -hmm. there is an immediate role that a technical college or a community college can play to fix the immediate need of the industry yep. to where then that immediate need can be fixed at the post-secondary level right. and then we can fix this level in another year or exactly. the seniors who are graduating, right? And having that relationship too, not only with industry but also with your post-secondary partners and saying, okay, let's figure out as a community how we're gonna address this and mm -hmm. keep this employer here is, is really important. Which, which requires a lot more sharing of data between the different institutions. Yeah. I mean, when I was in Charlotte previously, we worked with a lot of German manufacturers mm -hmm. and Siemens was located there and the companies would come in and they'd say they wanna put a facility in the US and we'd be on a short list of maybe three or four other locations. We would work with our high school. We had a great high school, Olympic High School, and we had a great staff there that really understood their students and mapped to our Central Piedmont Mechatronics program. 
the industry was amazed that we, because we were the only one that was able to do this, we would talk about where individuals were in the life cycle of their education mm -hmm. and talk about how, well, we have you know, two sophomores that would right now fit. Yeah. By the time your facility comes online, we yeah. could tweak their education enough to get them through the yeah. process with the skills you need. Yeah. They were blown away. Yeah. But that's how companies think about life cycle and how they think about products. It, yeah. Students aren't products, but if you know there's two $70,000 jobs waiting yeah. for you at the end, and you share this information with teachers, parents, and kids, they may want to take an extra yeah, class yeah, or two yeah, or get yeah. a certification if they know that's waiting for them. I, the number I want you to remember from that is eight weeks. Are you waiting for this? Are you ready for this? They're gonna <laughs> Somebody in your school district is going to say eight weeks. Um, but that translator role, so who should be providing those translators? And you know, just lightning round here, is that the state should be providing? Is that the industry associations should be providing? You know, really who should do that translation? And don't, talk, don't tell me a whole paragraph, just uh, tell me who you think should do it. Let's go this I way. I mean, I think it varies by community, because each community is different. It varies by community. community right. I mean, in some communities, it may be a workforce entity like a workforce board, it may be community college, it may be a chamber. Right. But I think it, it, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all one size because all. every organization based on your community is going to be different and who okay. needs that. Heather? Yeah, I think, I think the state can play a role in helping provide assistance. I mean, I think you actually mentioned this in your opening remarks on helping provide schools and districts with resources on understanding how to connect and reach mm -hmm. out. And so I do think there's a role that we play there. Um, and we also play that role if you're talking about state agencies. So the Department of Education working with economic and community development, working with the Department of Labor so that on some level we're on the same page so right. that at the community there's a sense of also sameness and they're not hearing four different messages from different institutions. So I do think the state plays a role in building that cohesive messaging and understanding what we're asking for. You guys are really that, bad at lightning cool. round. I said, I said lightning round, yeah. <laughs> not paragraphs. Quick answer, who should be the translator? So I would say the hybrid of the two yeah. because um, the state often has to remove barriers that, that we may have in our regulation or we may have in, in, in just even just misunderstanding of what we do. But if we do it right and we have the right statewide partners, then I think that you get, when it gets down to the brass tacks of in a region, there are people you, that employers and educators know they can trust to be that intermediate. That's like economic development people or um, chamber people? I or? think it, can, it depends on, on the community. The community. I, okay, you know, we have no some communities size. where it's the chamber that is very yeah. strong and some where it's the, the workforce investment yeah, board. Yeah, I, got it. I mean, it just sort of depends okay. on the dynamic. Okay, okay Sharice, translator, lightning round. Um, same, same as what... Uh, <laughs> Everybody said. Yes, what yeah, everyone yeah. else said. It's really based on, and I've mentioned this earlier, it's specific to that community, whatever their, their strongest link, link is in that community, where it's, whether it's their local chamber, uh, whether it's their um, uh, government officials, city, county, um, with taxes and millages that could support the effort. Um, and then their administrators, of course, and school leaders are important. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, it's critical that we have the everyone at the table talking and that we find that strongest link that can keep that message consistent and keep it going over time. And so and, our, I mean, okay. jump in on that one because if you ask businesses what they would like most from their local or regional government, they say a single point of contact. Single point we, of contact. In, in yes. regions that have multiple districts, yeah. multiple community colleges, yeah. everyone wants to have that relationship and therefore the employer is inundated yeah. with people. So someone's got to quarterback right. that because yeah. otherwise the employers get sort of turned off by it. Yeah, yeah. And I know we're in okay. lightning round, but just one quick thing to add. I also think this is what, the, the reason the state needs to play a role too is because sometimes we've got to help people understand that you are preparing kids for a career rather than a job. And, and, and yeah. us helping them understand that, you know, spinning wing nuts on the back of a dishwasher is not what we're wanting. We, there's a, a bigger, more in-depth conversation. And every now and then in some parts of, of our state, there are uh, businesses that are like, I just need basically somebody to come work on this assembly line. And we're saying, well, if you ever close, then those kids are not going to have careers. Yeah. So I think there, there's a role that has to be played there too. Okay, I learned my lesson, no more lightning no rounds. Um, okay, let's talk about yeah. industry recognized credentials. And a lot of you brought up the industry credentials in your opening remarks. Um, as, as you know, Steve kind of laid out the problem for us. You know, who knows what, how many there really are, there are out there. Is it 4,000, is it 6,000, is it 2,500? I've seen a lot of different counts. But we all know only about 100 or 200 have real currency nationally. And different ones have different currency 
in, in, in regions and in places. So, you know, the questions are partly like, how do you decide which ones the state's going to recognize? Then there's a harder question about how do you align them or not align them or make articulation to other kinds of regular, you know, an academic track. And then do you pay for them? Virginia's paying for them. Do yeah. other states pay for them? So let's start at your end. You've talked a little bit about it, but let's talk, um, let's answer some of those other questions. Like how does, how does Virginia decide which ones really are, are valid? Well, I mean, we, we invest a lot in data. We've got two full-time people just in data. my office looking at all the burning glass, jobs EQ, all these different tools that are out there to say what is being advertised, what does the job market need, and, and then it's sort of an overlay of what the community wants. Yeah. Because sometimes the, the top demand job might be retail. Right. The, is that where you want to put your limited dollars to get people skilled up in retail, or are you trying to go up, you know, partner with economic developers and say, we're going to bring in manufacturing, we're going to invest in cyber. So when those two align, that's where you get the, the nexus of saying, these are the things we're going to go into, because the community has to buy off on this, because there's never enough money. We ran out of our state money this year, five months into the, the budget year. Yeah, yeah. So they had to shut the program down. And so when you're getting that sense of the community, so you're looking at your data, so there are regional meetings now that are deciding on which of those, which are really the high demand credentials, and they differ all over the state, right? Yeah. It's a different list in Nova than there is down in somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the critical piece is that, you know, and, and publishing that information, we have very little manufacturing in Northern Virginia because of the high price of land. Most of the manufacturing's yeah. moved south in Virginia. But I have school districts that are doing MT1 certification. Yeah. There were no jobs in Northern yeah. Virginia, but we're doing certifications that do not align with our economic mission or our local job market. So it's really making sure that, you know, wherever, whatever you agree on, the data's got to get out and push it out to the districts and to all the partners. Right. And then, so you've talked a little bit about funding, you've talked about, or a lot, of, and you've talked about how you pick them. What about that articulation piece? And we'll come to, everybody will get a chance to weigh in on this. So, you know, I've got my cyber, I did my A plus, and I did my cyber security, and now I'm, five years later, I'm coming back to school and I yep. want a degree. Is it, um, what's going to happen to me? Yeah, I mean, for a long time we've talked about how we can map credentials to degrees. Uh, it's sort of the stackability issue. And if you look at it, it makes it real simple. Our cyber degree at Northern Virginia Community College is our fastest growing degree, 1,500 students from 53 years ago. Wow. Three of the classes map to certifications, A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+. Plus. We, we are not there yet in getting the faculty to buy off on allowing them. They've said, well, if they earn them at NOVA, we'd accept them. Oh, wow. But like, not no, a no, 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 no. Hey, it's it doesn't a matter where they it's are. A it's a standard. It's a standard, folks. And that's the problem with its stackability. We've yeah. got to get faculty and administrators to buy off on this concept that it doesn't matter where the knowledge is, as long as there's a third party validation of that knowledge, that we've got to give credit. And that, that's big for business because they don't want to be paying for these things twice. And nor does a student. We shouldn't have someone, again, our demographics change who's going after certs, and they don't have the time or the resources to repeat three classes when they took it over the previous three years. Yeah, it's too bad we can't bring the audience into this conversation yeah. because, uh, <laughs> you know, we're talking about changing an awareness at, mm -hmm. the, at the school level. Um, so, yeah, let's keep going down the line about how do you answer these qu certification questions? Yeah, so we're pretty lucky that, again, we use our industry advisor councils. We do open it up. We review the list annually. Um, and being in this day and age, especially in the IT sector, you have to. Um, they change the names on certifications. They tweak competencies within the certifications. Um, and so constantly doing that alignment, and I'll say in a state where we already have an alignment of our current technical education programs of study to in-demand labor and post-secondary programs in the state, then the alignment of industry certifications to programs of study is easy because you've already done that data, right? You've looked at your, your trends and your hot areas. Um, if you haven't, then you almost have to begin with the end and backwards design it then. And so you begin with the certifications and then backwards design your programs of study to ensure students are successful there. Because in Tennessee we were able to, we already had really strong programs of study and aligned, um, one of the criteria is that the certifications are cumulative for a course or summative over an entire program of study. And we worked with our Tennessee Colleges of Applied Technology to guarantee credit um, it's essentially, it's a prior learning assessment. So in the post-secondary world where they talk about not being able to articulate, they, they do prior learning assessments really well. Um, these industry certifications are no different. And so they've agreed and did a statewide MOU that any certification on our list articulates into a Tennessee College of Applied Technology for oh, wow. credit. Wow, um, that's we a big built, deal. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
We built into then so our So again, because I'm, I'm just clearly and simply, so you already have a statewide agreement that if people earn an industry certification on your list, it articulates to credit. And to a reasonable, decent, fair amount of credit, I mean, I heard something yesterday about a technical course where the clock, 2,600 clock hours translated <laughs> into 30 credits, you know, or something, you know, hours or something. So there's, they're not all are created equal. Yep. Um, so one, what we had to do first and foremost is we also added industry certifications, let just like Kentucky into our accountability system. And so we had to actually figure out how much those would count for, right? Yeah. So in Tennessee's accountability model, the student has to earn two early post-secondary, or complete two early post-secondary credits and earn an industry certification to be a ready graduate. So that could be dual credit, dual enrollment, AP, IB, Cambridge, any of those things, and an, an industry certification. But when we were working with our post-secondary systems, we saw that some of our more robust industry certifications already carried a lot of credit at the post-secondary institutions. Um, so we did a conversion from clock hours to credit hours. Wow. So for each industry certification, essentially, um, not every institution follows the same model. However, because it's a funding question, they all had to follow the funding, like the financial aid formula. So we actually use the financial aid formula for students who would be going from a technical college to a community college to determine that the translation was 30 clock hours to one credit hour. So 90 clock hours would equal the equivalent of a typical post-secondary course, right? A three credit hour course. So if the industry certification carried 90 clock hours, the equivalent of one course, then it just counted as an industry certification for our accountability system. If it held 180, so on and so forth, then it would count for an industry certification and one early post-secondary opportunity, or it would count for the entire program. And that incentivizes students who are earning those more rigorous and robust certifications to just focus on that, continue pushing through that program of study, prepare themselves for that, and then take that on. But that credit would then articulate. So Steve, talk to us about how, I don't think you've told us about how your state decides which of the certifications are worth doing worth giving recognizing? Well, what we do, um, we, first a couple of years ago, we started, um, we recognized that KDE making the decisions even about pathways wasn't necessarily going to be the best for the, Kentucky. The Kentucky Department of Education. Right. And so we um, actually take all of our pathways for approval to our Kentucky Workforce Investment Board. To the WIB. So the WIB actually makes that decision. Well, we, we took that the next step with our industry certifications. Now, because it's part of our accountability system, this will come as a surprise to people, but to, you know, there are some out there that will seek the easiest industry certification because they can get a banner. <laughs> so, yeah. what, you know, and it makes it tough because, you know, now, you know, it's KDE, the Kentucky Department of Ed, saying this is what you need to do. Um, you know, they push back on us and they do anyway, even with our process. But the way we've set up the process is each individual WIB, so the 10 regional yeah. WIBs, they have a way that they can submit to us and, and the KWIB, here are the industry certifications we need for our area. And then it gets approved at the, at the state level in that way. And what that does for us is, is there are some of ours, especially that are a full program of study, th that one little certification won't really be, make a student employable. And frankly, it lets us say, hey, this is what industry said. Yeah. So we're able to do some stackable credentials that frankly, I don't think we would have been able to do had it not been for actually our workforce saying, yeah. this is what, this is the only way we're gonna hire these students. Yeah. Um, so it, it kind of gives us a, a, a little bit more authority. I mean, it, we had to give up some authority to get it. And, and so I think it makes it a little bit more powerful for us to say to a district, no, we're not going to count this kid as career ready in your region because your WIB said they, didn't they need to have these two credentials. Now, we're, we're in an interesting place. We're about to go into our long session, which ironically have, is the same length session. as our short legislative session. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Kentucky. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, long story. But anyway, um, we're going into our budget session. And we actually, by law, are supposed to pay for industry certification. Ah. But by our count right now, that'd be about another six million dollars um, for us to do that, and, and we don't have that. So one of the things we're pushing for in our next legislative session are money for us to put career counselors at our 
uh, area technical centers and the six million dollars to be able to pay for these industry certifications. Right. This is good because we're going to come to funding in a minute. We, we're we're Sharice, you're, we're going to spend the last ten minutes on funding. But talk to us about how you how how Arkansas decides which credentials of the 4,000, of the 6,000, of the however many there are? Well, through policy, uh, recently in our 2017 session and then prior to that in our 2015 session, we further define industry recognized certifications. Uh, we moved from an end of course exam uh, in our career and technical courses to an industry certification wow. end of pathway, wow. but we're still developing all the things that were talked about here, you have to take all of that into consideration. Most importantly is assessing what your business and industries recognize. So we already have a Microsoft and an innovative Microsoft and CertiPort um, contract heard about where students are, are taking the, the courses within their uh, program of study and then they are ending with a, a certification and our numbers are just, uh, are just uh, growing time. substantially. Great. So. We're excited about that, but then we also have the industry certification list that is just very lengthy, but we haven't always looked at which ones the industries recognize. And then we're encouraging our industries to put that on their job requirements because if the students don't see that that's required at the job, there's no value. Sure. And we shouldn't be paying for that. Absolutely. We just have a lot of certifications absolutely. that really mean nothing to yeah, anyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it does cost a lot of money. So we're looking at how do we, how we're asking our employers, if that's important to you, make sure it's on there. So when the student is searching for jobs and we are telling them the importance of that certification, they will see that that's going to be one of the things that's going to be required in order to get an interview at that company and if you have that certification, that's going to get your foot in the door and you're going to have an advantage over other applicants. Okay, money. We're going to talk money. Um, in journalism, you know, the headline that catches all the attention, sex and violence. We're going to talk about money. Um, so let's start with you, Steve, because you were going to do this earlier and I didn't yeah. let you do it. You know, why is this hard? Why is this expensive? Why is money such a big deal in this field? Well, when you talk about building actually industry high demand courses, you have two factors. Sometimes if you're in manufacturing, the equipment itself is outrageous. Equipment. The equipment is expensive. Cyber, we use computers, it's not as much, but in Charlotte, we wanted, you know, if you've ever done a factory tour, you walk around, my favorite question on the tour is how much does that cost? And it's millions of dollars. So if you're an educational institution and you say, I'm gonna train folks to enter the workforce that have those skills and actually touch the equipment you're gonna put them on, I gotta invest millions of dollars. Healthcare too, some of that stuff is changing so quickly, our stuff becomes obsolete very quickly. And I think in the US system, we're very good at when there's a lot of fanfare, launch a new program, we'll get some equipment. You build a building, there's always equipment funds with it, and then it ages, and there's never the replacement dollars, like our bridges. You know, we're good at building things, we're not good at replacing them over the life cycle. Okay, so first cost, high cost equipment. Second? The second is faculty. I mean, if you're talking hiring folks, in, in DC, a senior uh, AWS programmer uh, costs you about $300,000. $300,000? 300000 that's a big, that's a high teacher and, salary. And the word senior is misleading. It's not like someone's 30 years experience. It's like, yeah. you know, five to seven years experience. Wow. So, that's a pretty high teacher salary. Yeah. So if I have to hire these people. <laughs> uh, we got them la they're <laughs> laughing. Exactly. They're laughing. <laughs> if I crying. have to hire someone, oh, yeah. I have to charge an outrageous amount to get a return on investment for us to make the class affordable. Yeah. So uh, that's been a big push and pull because the state's trying to standardize the pricing of all these certification classes. So my prices are much higher than Hampton Roads, but so faculty and finding faculty and getting them the price point that we can afford. And then there's the teacher-student ratio too, yeah. right? These yeah, I mean, 35 students might be a normal credit class. It is not. We're usually about, I mean, we just got a new building, they gave it to us, and they built all the classrooms to hold 35 people. We're like, we don't use, no you, one asked you us. You can't teach welding yeah, it's 35 like 15 to 1. to 18 is like the ideal for us. So smaller class size, higher cost faculty, and expensive equipment. And, and the system, the way we fund it in Virginia, in most states, is it's not set up to deal with that. So you've, told, you've diagnosed the problem, and we are kind of getting tight here on time. So we do have to get to kind of lightning round now. We have five lightning minutes round. and 32 seconds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you think I'm kidding. Um, so talk to us just quickly, and let's go, let's go this way. Um, about, let's go ladies first, and then we'll end with Stephen. About how your state, um, you know, deals with 
this, or the best thing your state does to deal with this, to make up this differential funding, the special funding? What do they do in Tennessee? Yeah, so um, quickly, uh, we do fund CTE courses at a higher rate. Um, so there CTE is- CTE courses at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. So the dollars generated through the local districts are actually um, slightly higher, also has a smaller student class size. So we have a class size cap of 25, safety, et cetera. Um, but they are funded at a slightly higher rate. Obviously, Perkins flows through. That is not adequate. Um, we are very lucky this year to get $15 million from the governor uh, and the legislature for specifically CTE equipment in our high needs area, okay. which is great. We'll need to continue, though, right? Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, Sharice, what do you guys do to, to make up this funding gap? Um, we have a tax credit in place for the donation of equipment. Okay. And oh, wow. We had a manufacturer recently, I think was the first yeah. one that, even though it had been in place for quite some yeah. time, uh, they just utilized that tax credit. Yeah. And so we're all, that, as that conversation's continuing into, is, are there other opportunities for tax credits yeah. for manufacturers and business and industry in Arkansas where they can get a tax credit for just their not only the donation of equipment, but a match on a building or wow. other. Wow, other, uh, that's, that's really interesting. I want to learn more about that. Stephen, you're going to have the last word. What um, are you doing here? And if you talk about a banner, no. <laughs> yeah, we're going, to read, <laughs> we're going to redirect all of our banner money into our <laughs> CTE money. Um, the, um, now, I, I mean, it's a struggle for us in Kentucky. I mean, we've got um, some districts that are, that are doing well to keep the doors open. Um, so. One of the things, that, and this may sound a little bit strange because we've got a lot of the same things going on that these folks do, but in our new accountability system, we also had to put in something that allowed for more collaboration so that we could offer more. And more collaboration so you could offer Between more. districts uh -huh. and also between the, the state and the district mm -hmm. because a, a single district, especially in Eastern Kentucky, can't yeah, offer those courses. Yeah. In our old system, everything was very ranked, so everybody was pitted against one another. So actually there's an incentive now for you to partner with a neighboring district to offer more CTE pathway. Um, and for us, we have 53 area technical centers that are actually run by the state that offer direct instruction to students. And we're looking at how we can expand that to be able to offer, have more offerings to our kids around the state. Great. So really interesting panel. I know we did kind of get into the technicalities and the nuts and bolts of process, but I th you know, the thing to remember is these people are spending their days using data, thinking creatively about, about how to make the incentives work to make it easier for those employers and educators to you and the employers to get in the same room and, and talk the same language to each other. So I'm sure these panelists will be around uh, later in, you know, early, later this morning if you want to buttonhole them and ask them further questions we didn't get to. Uh, thank you so much and thanks for your interest. Yep. Thank you.